Hello, I'm Bill Caswell, President of the National Society for the Preservation of Covered Bridges. I'd like to thank the Sandown Public Library for this opportunity to talk to you today about some of New Hampshire's past and present covered bridges. We'll do the presentation. Uh, first, I'll be speaking about some general information about the bridges and then focus on some New Hampshire bridges and then direct our attention more towards the southeastern part of the state. First, a little bit about our organization. The National Society was founded in 1950 by a group of individuals who enjoyed getting together on occasion and sharing stories and photographs of their covered bridge visits. In 1952, they joined a local campaign to save a bridge in West Dumberston, Vermont, which was going to be replaced as part of a highway improvement project. This group was successful and the bridge was relocated to Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts. After the success of that project, they got a little more interested in preservation of bridges rather than just getting together as a social group. In August of 1954, the organization was officially incorporated in Boston, Massachusetts. <clears throat> we hold monthly meetings uh, between March and October of each year under normal circumstances. We also have four quarterly publications that we send out to our members. Cover Bridge Topics is primarily historical information about bridges with photos from our archives. And our newsletter includes information about um, our meetings and Cover Bridge news. Prior to getting involved with the Cover Bridge Society, I and a couple of colleagues had formed uh, or started a research project, which we called Covered Spans of Yesteryear. The intent of the project was to document all of the wooden truss bridges throughout the United States and Canada. We had found that um, information about existing covered bridges was rather easy to get, and, but information about those of the past was much more difficult, uh, requiring looking through books, research in libraries, historical societies, and so on. So we made the effort to gather this information and we present it on our website for everyone else to see. This is a sample of the type of information we look for on each bridge. You know, it's on the left side, basic statistical information about the bridge, length and when it was built, when it was lost, and so on. On the right side, there are photographs when we find them. And so far we have probably less than a third of the bridges have photographs with them. We have some historical comments about the bridge, information that we might have that we think will be of interest to the general user. And it, um, importantly for other researchers, our sources of information. We started this project in 2003, and over the past 17 years, we have documented more than 13,000 covered bridges. The most populous reason, region, region, as you can see from the slide here, is Ohio, with over 4,400 documented wood truss bridges in Ohio. New Hampshire, down at the bottom of this list, has about a tenth of that. <clears throat> Now, as we're going through this project, we're often provided with photos and slides of covered bridges. Uh, many are identified, some aren't, but the more serious situation is when they're misidentified. Now, this one is for anyone who's been to Conway, who's probably recognized this bridge as the Swift River, Swift River Covered Bridge in Conway. But if we get a photo of a historic bridge that we don't recognize, and it's mislabeled, it can, we can continue mislabeling that photo, putting it on our website incorrectly. Like for example, if you had received this postcard from Ohio, you might think that those two bridges are in Ohio, when in fact, the lower one is the Swift River Bridge in Conway, and the upper one was called the Old Lattice Bridge, which stood in Woodstock, New Hampshire, until it was lost to arson in 1971. These two bridges have traveled extensively throughout the country, being on postcards from a variety of regions. And any one of them, a person receiving the card not familiar with the bridge might actually think that the bridge is in that area. Now, from a historic preservation standpoint, you know, for us today, historic preservation is pretty much just part of life. It's something that we do. It's, it's, it's expected of our historic buildings, structures, bridges, and so on. That wasn't the case 100 years ago. 
For example, this uh, newspaper clipping from the Naugatuck, Connecticut Daily News of May 12, 1900, <clears throat> which says, it would be a big improvement to the town if that old covered bridge were torn down and replaced with an iron bridge. It is true that such an improvement would be quite expensive, but it would be worth more than it would cost. The days of covered bridges with the disease breeding germs that accumulate in them have passed, and Beacon Falls would take a step in the right direction by doing away with that old wooden structure and putting up a more modern bridge. Three weeks later, the same newspaper, it wouldn't be a bad idea to give the roadway of the covered bridge some cleaning. The stench that arose from waste matter here Friday was enough to make a person feel sick. Why not take off the cover, or better still, build a new bridge without a cover? A new iron bridge in place of that old covered bridge would be an ornament to the town that would be worth all it would cost. Unfortunately for this writer, the covered bridge at Beacon Falls, Connecticut would stand for 35 more years. So, how do we define a covered bridge? Well, for the purposes of our presentation and our organization, it's a bridge primarily supported by a wooden or mostly wooden truss used for vehicle traffic, that being either carriages, uh, cars, trucks, trains, boats. Um, for our purposes, we typically classify covered bridges by their truss type. <clears throat> it's just one of the ways we, we organize our, our list of bridges. The simplest truss types are pretty much date from medieval times as far as bridge structure goes and building structure. The most, uh, the simplest one is the king post truss, which is at the top of this slide. The actual king post is that center vertical post in the truss with the two diagonal ones connected to it. And the intent there is that some of the load from the bridge will be put onto that center king post which is notched into the diagonal timbers and the load is transmitted to the diagonal timbers outward towards the abutments. And that's pretty much the intent of every truss. Uh, the, the goal there is to always take the load from within the bridge and somehow move it towards the supporting uh, abutments or piers at the ends. The queen post truss is just kind of an extension of the king post. It's just spread a little wider, has some extra bracing can get you distances of 50 to 70 feet maybe. And then there's the multiple king post truss, which just repeats that vertical post and diagonal post uh, set up to transmit the loads from one to the other. One vertical post will transmit it to the next diagonal out, outward. That diagonal post will be notched into the bottom of the next vertical post, so it transmits the load to the next vertical and so on all the way to the end of the bridge. In 1805, a gentleman named Theodore Burr uh, improved on the king post trust, the multiple king post trust, by adding an arch to it. <clears throat> and he patented this as the Burr truss. By adding the arch, he was able to significantly increase the span distance that could be covered by the truss. The, in fact, the longest single span covered bridge ever known to have been built was a Burr truss over 300 feet long. Ithiel Town from New Haven, Connecticut, on the other hand, saw that while the, the Burr truss was a good sturdy truss, it was also complicated to build. And sometimes requiring that uh, you bring in individuals from other cities specialized in this kind of construction. And sometimes it could be more expensive because you're paying the living expenses for the, the crew. <clears throat> he wanted to develop a truss that was simple enough that any good carpenter would be able to build it. So he came up with this design for the town truss, which is also referred to as the lattice truss. And in the lattice truss, it's just a crisscross timbers uh, throughout the bridge. And everywhere where a timber crosses another one, a wooden peg called a trunnel is pegged into the bridge to hold them together. It's a very sturdy truss. And nowadays, half of the covered bridge is still standing, either have a burr or a town truss. Some of the other trusses that appear in New Hampshire covered bridges are the Long Truss, which was developed by Colonel Stephen Long of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This is essentially a, um, two vertical posts which are braced by diagonal timbers. So it, it looks kind of like a box with an X in the center of it. 
Uh, one of the features of the Long Trust was that uh, Colonel Long included wedges down the bottom to pre-stress the trusses, making it even stronger. William Howe from Massachusetts sought to improve that a little bit, and he replaced the wooden vertical posts by iron rods. This was when iron was becoming more available and uh, cheaper and easier to get. And the Howe Trust was very strong, very sturdy, and it became an instant pop instantly popular with the railroads. It was used on railroads throughout the country. Even today, you'll find that many of the covered bridges in New Brunswick and Oregon use the Howe Trust because of its strength uh, for their logging trucks. A kind of a regional variation um, was made by Peter Paddleford of Littleton called the Paddleford Trust. Paddleford never patented his design, so it was used by a number of builders uh, in northern New Hampshire, northeastern Vermont, and northwestern Maine, but it's not seen outside of that region. <clears throat> so, why were bridges covered? Well, a common answer that I, I often see in newspaper articles and in books is that so the horses wouldn't be scared to cross the river. While it's an interesting theory, um, open bridges existed for centuries before they started putting roofs over them and horses seem to have been able to cross at those times. So that's not necessarily the reason. And then there have even been a couple instances where um, people have said that they were built to provide shelter during the storms. If you're out on a rural, rural road somewhere and get caught in a storm, you can just go to the nearby covered bridge and hang out and wait. Well, nice idea, great you know, side benefit to having the covered bridge, but not the reason for constructing it. <clears throat> the real reason is to protect the wooden trusses. Uh, similar to why you have walls and roof on your house to protect the structural components of the house, same thing with the bridge. The, Wooden truss of the bridge is the structural part of it that's doing all the work supporting the load and putting the roof and walls over it uh, will make a 10 to 15 year lifespan of a bridge extend into a century or more. The first documented covered bridge was built in Philadelphia in 1805 by Timothy Palmer of Newburyport, Massachusetts. Palmer had built a number of open bridges throughout New England and had written letters to the judge who was in charge of the Philadelphia project, commenting about how he was embarrassed that his bridges were, uh, had such a short lifespan because the owners were unwilling to pay the extra money to have them covered. The judge in Pennsylvania was convinced and he offered Palmer the opportunity to fully cover his bridge over the Schuylkill River. This bridge lasted for 70 years until it was lost in a fire, but it was still good and sturdy at the time. Within New Hampshire, we've identified nearly 400 covered bridge locations throughout the state. Now you may have noticed that before I mentioned there were 444 documented bridges within New Hampshire, and that's because some of those locations have had multiple covered bridges on them. Of those locations, about a third of them were railroad bridges. Uh, railroad covered bridges were quite popular when the railroads were first being constructed in the state in the 1840s and 1850s, and obviously replaced by iron and steel in later years. <clears throat> there were 40 Connecticut River crossings with Vermont, uh, one crossing with Maine, and 53 of those covered bridges are still standing, of which five are railroad bridges. And that's really unusual because there are only seven railroad covered bridges left in the entire country, and five of those are here in New Hampshire. So over the years from our, our research, we found that um, including all the information about our bridges, about 60% of covered bridges have just been lost through progress. Uh, just natural progression, uh, the road needed to be widened or the bridge was old, needed to be strengthened, and so on. But it's just natural progress caused about 60% of the bridges to be replaced. Floods have also accounted for another 17%. And then you start getting to the smaller percentages of uh, fires of either unknown origin or natural origin or railroad bridges, which were subject to fire, um, about 8% and 5% for arson. If we narrow these numbers down to look at just the last 30 years, what you'll notice is that now arson is the number one cause of loss for our covered bridges. 
whereas a few of them are still replaced. There are still a few that uh, deteriorate to the point where they cannot be repaired anymore and either are rebuilt as covered bridges or sometimes just replaced as a regular bridge. And of course, floods are still a um, still cause of loss over the years. The most recent loss of a covered bridge or a historic covered bridge was almost a year ago on July 5th of 2019, uh, the Knowlton Bridge in Monroe County, Ohio. And although it's, it's sad that the bridge was lost, it's even worse knowing that Monroe County had a plan to repair the bridge, knowing that it was in need of help. They had some money available, they had plans prepared for it. The project went out to bid, but the lowest bid was still um, quite in excess of the money they had available. So they were in the process of trying to raise additional funds and looking for other ways to reduce the cost of the repairs when the bridge collapsed. One that we're looking at at the moment uh, that's on the verge of collapse is this bridge in Fleming County, Kentucky. This bridge, the, the abutments of the bridge have been washing away little by little for years and spring rains this year happened to cause a significant uh, loss of the abutment and the bridge is starting to drop. So Kentucky transportation officials are looking at it. Uh, they have a plan to at least stabilize it before it does collapse and we're hoping that is successful. <clears throat> Within New Hampshire, we've had a couple interesting collapses of our own. Uh, this is the Chandler Railroad Bridge in Lebanon, which collapsed in April 1886. And the story behind this is that um, this was actually an act of vandalism, where it was a Howe Trust bridge, where the Howe Trust had the iron rods with uh, nuts at the end of those, those iron rods to be able to uh, tune the bridge to adjust it, uh, make it to strengthen it when it starts to wear and so on. And it was reported that some individuals had loosened the nuts on the end of those iron rods, thereby taking the, the iron rod out of the equation as far as the support system goes. So when the train crossed through it, uh, the bridge could not carry the weight of the train and it collapsed. <clears throat> One that was a bit less dramatic was in Franklin Junction, also a railroad bridge. Uh, this bridge was damaged in flooding in 1936 when the center pier supporting the bridge washed out. Although uh, support, extra supports were added uh, to one end of the bridge, it was never used for rail traffic again. But pedestrians used to cross the bridge regularly uh, back and forth across the river. And then on the morning of September 26, 1945, local area residents noted that they heard the bridge creaking and groaning and eventually they heard the loud crash as it just collapsed into the river. This is a photo of it in its better days. Uh, after the flooding, which took out the center pier, but after the supports had been added to help support the bridge for um, pedestrian use. Now railroad covered bridges were particularly susceptible to fire. The old uh, steam engines, uh, throwing sparks or cinders or uh, stuff like that along the way would ignite debris, um, old leaves, twigs and things like that into the bridge. And then it didn't take much to transfer that fire to the nice uh, dry hundred year old wood. So railroad bridges were often a, a problem there with fire. This is, happens to be the Kelly Fall Bridge in Manchester, which burned in September of 1941. And like the others, it's believed that it was uh, the result of sparks from a train passing through. This bridge used to stand in Bennington, New Hampshire, in the southwest corner of the state. And if you're familiar with the Bennington area, this was right next to the paper mill. It was lost in 1965, again believed to have been caused by sparks from a passing tra train, uh, igniting debris within the bridge, which caught the rest of the bridge on fire. This photo of the construction of the covered railroad bridge in Hillsborough, New Hampshire is rather un unusual in that it's, it's rare that we find construction photos. Also notice the men at the top with no safety gear or anything of the sort. The, those were the times when we were much braver than we are today and, and not nearly as safe. <clears throat> this is a photo of the bridge taken in 1947. 
kind of in its heyday when it was still used for rail traffic. And this picture is from the one and only time I got to see the bridge in 1984. I moved to New Hampshire in 1984, and then it was lost to arson on Halloween night of 1985. Goffstown, New Hampshire also had a covered bridge. The Boston Main Railroad built covered bridges long beyond uh, the time when most other railroads had converted to iron and steel structures. J.P. Snow, who was head of the engineering department uh, in bridge construction, decided that uh, wooden bridges were more economical than iron. Uh, even though they uh, had a shorter lifespan, they were so much cheaper to build, it was more economical to continue building wooden bridges instead of switching over to iron. So he continued building wooden bridges long after every other railroad had switched to iron and eventually steel. But this particular bridge in Goffstown uh, was built in 1900, and the fire at this bridge in 1976 is believed to have been accidental, but nonetheless, it destroyed the bridge, which used to stand right in the center of town. And, um, was used quite a bit by local residents. One of the survivors is this railroad bridge in Franklin, uh, the Sulfite Railroad Bridge. You'll notice that this one's a bit unusual in that the truss work is actually under the bridge instead of on top of it. Uh, the railroad ran on the roof of this structure and the, and the support system is underneath. That was preferred by railroads, but unfortunately the rivers weren't, or the bridges weren't always high enough above the river to be able to do that without risking uh, flood damage. But by having the structure under the bridge and the train running on top, any sparks from the train would fall harmlessly off the roof of the bridge into the water instead of igniting debris inside the bridge. Now some of them still did catch fire, but it was a less risk than, uh, than an enclosed bridge. This particular one did catch fire in 1980. Uh, fortunately, only the siding was burned and the, the rails were actually warped because of the heat. Uh, the structure is still intact. Uh, it, it has been sitting like this uncovered for the last 40 years. There have been efforts within the city of Franklin to uh, try and get it recited, but uh, so far that has not happened. New Hampshire's longest covered bridge was also one of those deck truss railroad bridges uh, at 105 feet above the Sauhegan River, the 625 foot long uh, covered bridge in Greenville lasted until 1907 when it caught fire and being so remote, so high above the water, there's no way the firefighters could do anything to save it. Uh, the best they could do is protect the trees around the ends to uh, prevent a forest fire from taking over. This is one of my particular favorite pictures uh, it, over the Connecticut River in Hinsdale, New Hampshire to South Vernon, Vermont. And this picture was, um, may have been taken shortly after the bridge was constructed. It, we've seen some other photos like this where the railroad would kind of stage the photo after the bridge was constructed. You put a train on it and get pictures and uh, have a celebration of the opening of the bridge and showing its strength by having the train sitting on it. And certainly one of the most unusual covered bridges within New Hampshire was this combination bridge in Woodsville, also over the Connecticut River to Wells River, Vermont. The train ran on the roof, like some of the other deck truss bridges, but in this particular instance, if you look closely at the ends, you'll see those square openings where the roadway went through. So carriages would enter the bridge through one of the openings, make the 90 degree turn to go through the bridge, and then the 90 degree turn to get out of the bridge onto the roadway on the other side. And I can only imagine what it would have been like to go through this bridge in a horse and carriage and then have one of those freight trains go thundering over your head. It must have really scared the horses then. Today, you can see, still see covered railroad bridges. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are five of them throughout the state, one of them being the Franklin Bridge we already saw, and this Wrights Railroad Bridge in Newport. Newport is fortunate enough to have two of those five railroad covered bridges on the Sugar River Rail Trail. It's a multi-use trail that goes from Newport uh, westward towards Claremont. Wright's Railroad Bridge was built in 1905. Uh, on that trail, it's, it's probably about a thousand foot walk from the roadway to get to the bridge, but it's a beautiful sight when you get there. And Pier Railroad Bridge 
also called Pierre Station Railroad Bridge, which is right next to the road and easy to, uh, easy to visit and see. Now you notice from the people in this photo just how huge and massive these covered bridges were built for the railroads. And this particular one has a double town truss where it's actually two town trusses sandwiched together for, um, to carry the 176,000 pound weight of the freight trains that they were designed for. <clears throat> While in Newport, you may also want to check out the Corbin Cover Bridge, <clears throat> which is a, a newer bridge in New Hampshire built in 1994 to replace one that was lost to arson in 1993. There were three cover bridges lost to arson in New Hampshire in the spring of 1993. So in this particular instance, the people of Newport raised money to have the bridge rebuilt in 94. And last fall, they held a 25th anniversary celebration for the bridge. We had, uh, there was a, a park near the bridge where uh, tables were set up for vendors and displays. Uh, they arranged tours to the railroad cover bridges and so on. In the evening, they had a light show that lit up the cover bridge in a variety of colors that were changing through the night. It was quite an interesting celebration. But here is a photo of the Corbin Bridge prior to the fire, uh, built in 1835 and then lost in May of 1993. One of the other losses that spring was the Smith Bridge in Plymouth, lost in April of 1993. So the Smith Bridge, built in 1880, is the, the only one of the three that wasn't replaced with a replica of the original. Here's another photo of that bridge. But the bridge that replaced it in 2001 was called the Smith Millennium Bridge, which was much larger, two lanes wide, built to carry uh, all highway loads. So it's, it's much a larger, much sturdier bridge than, than the original. The Slate Bridge in Swansea, uh, again, lost in 1993, was replaced in 2001 by this bridge, which is very similar to the one that was uh, there prior. The older bridge built in 1862 was lost to arson in March of 1993. And in this 1962 photo, you might notice the uh, suspension system that was outside the bridge to help for uh, additional support. Uh, support system there had a couple uh, steel beams that were under the bridge and that helped to support it in its older years. Here's another photo of that bridge in Swansea. And if you happen to be in the Swansea area, you might also want to check out the West Swansea Bridge, which is one of the oldest covered bridges in the state, built in 1832. And there's another photo of that before that small dam just downstream from the bridge was removed. <clears throat> These bridges like the West Swansea Bridge and the Shwila Bridge here uh, are also referred to as village bridges because they were in the center of villages. They had walkways on the sides to keep pedestrians safely out of the traffic. Uh, this particular one in the Shwila was built in 1864 when the railroad came to town. The railroad was constructed on the other side of the river from the main part of town and the bridge was built to be able to get people and goods back and forth to the uh, train depot on the other side. And back to another of the railroad bridges uh, is this one in Kentuckuk. The Kentuckuk Railroad Bridge built in 1889 is the oldest of the surviving covered railroad bridges. This particular one's owned by the state of New Hampshire, uh, maintained by the Division of Historic Resources and has gone, undergone a number of repairs over the years and our organization has helped with those repairs both financially and by offering labor uh, towards projects. In the spring of 2019, uh, the state received a grant for painting the bridge, which was long overdue for a new paint job. <clears throat> the Kentucky Bridge also stands adjacent to uh, the old Contuga Depot, which has also been restored and can be visited. And the Contuga Bridge, like most of the other railroad bridges, well, actually all the railroad bridges that still exist, um, the two in Newport were built by the Boston Main Railroad to replace older covered bridges, as was the one in Contuga. And this is the only known photo of the first covered bridge, uh, covered railroad bridge in Contuga. 
It was probably built by Horace Childs of Henniker uh, in the 1840s. And when the Boston and Maine Railroad took over the lines in southern New Hampshire in the 1880s, they found that many of the bridges were either old or didn't meet the, uh, um, the weight needs of the rolling stock that they intended to run across those bridges. So that they often replaced them. Next to it is the covered, is the covered highway bridge, which uh, if you're familiar with the area, there's a stone bridge there now and, or arch bridge anyway. And that was at one time a covered bridge until 1935. Now, as I mentioned, Horace Childs had built the railroad bridge along with many other railroad bridges uh, in New Hampshire. He and his brothers uh, pretty much ran a company that uh, traveled all over building a lot of railroad bridges and other bridges. But between the three of them, they were able to cover the whole operation of the company. Horace was the master carpenter who built the bridge structure. Enoch Childs, uh, his brother, a Yale graduate, handled the business operations of the company. And Warren Childs was the stonemason, so he was the one who would uh, lead the crews building the abutments. Horace Childs was a cousin to Colonel Stephen Long, who we've mentioned before, and built railroad bridges throughout New England. He was one of uh, Colonel Long's uh, patent agents for building long truss bridges. Uh, Stephen Long never actually built uh, many covered bridges on his own. What he, he preferred to do is he patented his design and he would sell the rights to uh, various agents throughout the country to use his design. But it's interesting to note that the only, uh, well, um, Horace Childs patented his own truss, which was a variation of Long's. But it's interesting to note that the only Childs trusses which exist are in Ohio, and Childs is never known to have built bridges in Ohio. So David Simmons, who was president of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, wanted to try and find out why the Childs Trust became so popular in Ohio. And from his research, it appeared that the, the Childs Trust bridges started being constructed in Ohio the year after Horace's patent on this design had expired. So the builder would no longer be required to pay royalties to, to Horace Childs or his heirs to use the, the design. You can still see one of his bridges left today it is the, the Rollo Bridge in West Hopkinton. This was built in 1853 and in this 1965 photo you might uh, wonder why the center pier doesn't actually touch the bridge. Well, this was built as a single span bridge. Uh, you can probably see the arch in the, within the bridge to help support it. And in the 1930s, it was felt that uh, heavier vehicles crossing the bridge um, might damage the bridge or cause it to uh, end its life prematurely. So they were trying to be proactive and they built a center pier for additional support. What they did find, however, though, is that the single span bridge, when you put that center pier in there, it becomes a two span bridge, which it wasn't designed to be. And they found that as heavy trucks would cross the bridge, it would either teeter on that center pier, or they were also finding that the joints uh, connecting the timbers were becoming damaged and becoming looser uh, because joints that were originally designed to be in tension were now in compression because the, the pier was changing the forces in the bridge or vice versa. And they were actually doing more damage to the bridge by having that pier than not having it. So the top was lopped off so it doesn't touch the bridge. Here's an old, older photo of that bridge with a general store that used to stand beside it, which is now condominiums. So, um, I had mentioned Stephen Long and his Long and his patented bridge uh, design, which he sold to various agents throughout the country. And you, if you can read that, you'll notice that Horace Childs tops the list uh, as his cousin and primary agent in New Hampshire. Also, fourth way down the list, or this particular ad, by the way, came from a uh, railroad journal in 1837. But the fourth one down the list was the Thomas Cushing, who was from Dover, New Hampshire. Thomas Cushing started his career in 1838 building railroad cover bridges for the state of Illinois. And in 1838, uh, the, there were no railroads in Illinois and the state funded three different rail lines 
to be able to bring commerce into the state and, and help transport uh, materials and goods throughout the state. And Cushing was on the front line of that, that crew with a number of others to build the bridges along those lines. After the work in Illinois was finished, uh, he built bridges for the Boston Main Railroad throughout New England. And he's also reported to have built bridges in Maryland and Ohio, but I haven't found any details of those yet. Benjamin Collins, uh, who happened to marry Thomas Cushing's sister, also worked with him on bridge projects and they partnered together uh, on the Illinois projects and in the Boston and Maine bridges that they built uh, in New England. After Cushing's death in 1868, the partnership disbanded and Collins continued to work in the Dover area as a civil engineer and surveyor, also building a couple bridges for the town of Dover. In his obituary, he mentioned that he was considered an authority on how trust bridges. And down at the bottom there, you see a snippet I clipped out of an 1870 census record showing Benjamin Collins' uh, occupation as railroad bridge builder. One of the bridges that Collins built was this county farm bridge in Dover. And some of you who uh, from the area may have seen this. Uh, it was lost to arson in 1981. But originally, the first bridge on this site was built by Thomas Cushing for $1,075 in 1864. Unfortunately, that was during the Civil War, and some of the bridges built in Dover at that time were not immediately covered, causing them to, to start to deteriorate before, before their time. In this case, the bridge was eventually covered, that first bridge was eventually covered by Benjamin Collins for an additional $350. But by 1872, the town had noticed that the bridge was so badly deteriorated, they didn't feel it could be fixed and it had to be replaced. So they hired uh, Benjamin Collins in late 1872 to construct a new bridge, which he completed in January of 1873. So here's another photo of that. And as I mentioned, it was lost in September of 1981 to arson. Also in Dover was this railroad cover bridge, which we don't really know much about, but it was built around the same time period in the 1870s. And it stood near the uh, Dover train station. It was replaced in 1908-1909 by a, an iron deck truss bridge, uh, keeping with the deck truss pattern that, uh, of the wooden cover bridge. Certainly one of the more interesting bridges in the area was the Stover Toll Bridge. And uh, if you're familiar with the Dover Point area now, uh, this is the same location as it was in, well, prior to 1935. <clears throat> The Dover Toll Bridge, the, the one span of the, the Howe Trust structures, um, was built so boat traffic could pass through what was a, a trestle bridge throughout the rest of the area of the Great Bay. It was built in 1873 for both the railroad and highway use. The highway bridge was a toll bridge and the railroad bridge was right next to it, uh, as opposed to the, the combination bridge in Woodsville, which railroad was on top of the highway. It was originally built as a toll bridge because then at this time there was no state DOT or Federal Highway Administration to, to help fund large projects. So towns couldn't afford these projects on their own. So what they would do is allow a group of investors to form a corporation, sell shares to raise money to build the bridge. And then that corporation was allowed to charge tolls to help uh, recoup their expenses for bridge construction, pay their share, shareholders, and also to um, raise money for maintenance of the structure. This bridge continued as a toll bridge until 1933 when it was purchased by the state of New Hampshire from the shareholders. And then tolls were removed and the bridge was replaced two years later. Here's a photo showing the, the rail line quite clearly next to the highway line. Another covered bridge in Rochester, uh, railroad bridge, built around 1870, uh, had an interesting incident happen to it shortly before it was replaced. On July 3rd, 1904, two freight trains collided just outside the bridge. And other, um, other sources uh, mentioned this date as being in 1903, but I've actually found newspaper articles from July 4th of 1904 uh, mentioning that 
the accident had happened the prior day. And what happened here is that the freight train southbound from Boston, had, I mean from Portland rather, heading towards Nashua, um, was supposed to be on a siding waiting for the northbound train from Nashua to pass. The train from Portland was a running ahead of schedule and the engineer felt that he could make it to the next siding and pull off there and wait rather than stopping where he was originally supposed to pull off. Uh, he didn't make it and shortly after the Portland train passed through the bridge, it collided head on with the Nashua train. As you might expect, the abrupt stop caused the freight cars of, the, of both trains to derail, um, causing some damage to the bridge. In one instance, one of the freight cars the momentum just kept carrying it forward, so it went over the car ahead of it and ended up tearing out a lot of the roof of the bridge. The ridge, bridge was already um, not really in the best of condition to start with, uh, but the railroad accident made it only worse. And as we noted, a couple years later, it was replaced. Another interesting bridge uh, in Newmarket was not built for roadway use, but for pedestrian use uh, to, for workers to be able to get between two buildings across the river. And it's a little hard to see in this postcard, but if we get in a little closer to this 2005 photo, the bridge originally reportedly had uh, built around 1835, lasted until May of 2006, until floodwaters took it away. But it's kind of interesting to note that um, it was built for uh, workers to get between the two buildings of this company. And there were a couple others along the way too. There were, um, there were similar bridges at one time in Dover and in Milton. This bridge was lost in a flood in May of 2006 and shortly after the, the flood water subsided, volunteers went out and retrieved uh, what they could of the bridge structure that floated a little bit downstream. Now we don't know what happened to those uh, larger sections of trusses that were taken out. But we haven't heard any more of the story there. This covered railroad bridge in Raymond was probably one of the last surviving railroad bridges in the southeastern part of the state. Um, as far as we know, it was the, the last survivor in the southeastern corner of the state. Built around 1905, again by the Boston and Maine Railroad to replace a, an earlier covered bridge. It itself was replaced in 1943, and this particular photo was taken about the time it was being deconstructed. And here's another photo of it from a couple of years earlier. Salem also had a covered railroad bridge built in 1887, uh, just a little ways north of the Massachusetts state line on the, the rail line from Lawrence, Mass to Manchester. And it stood on what is now the Salem Rail Trail, uh, just north of where the San Salem An Animal Rescue League is. It was replaced in 1917. Now this one, not built for the railroad, but built by the railroad. Um, the rail Boston and Maine Railroad in particular built a number of these pony truss bridges over their rail lines to carry roads over the tracks. And a pony truss bridge is just a, a shorter version of a fully covered bridge. The walls are um, much shorter probably 10 to 12 feet high, but not high enough to be able to put a roof structure over top. And they're good for short distances, but the truss work is completely enclosed. It was completely boarded in, there's just no roof. But the Boston and Maine had built a number of these uh, throughout, or at least Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but as far as I know, this is the last one still surviving. And it's in Rollinsford, no longer carries roadway traffic. The road over the bridge has been abandoned for, well, a long time, uh, 1920s, 1930s, I think it was. But the bridge is still standing and it's still the responsibility of the railroad uh, to maintain it. But as you can see from the photo, it could use a little work on the maintenance. <clears throat> this photo I took in 2009 looks even worse and I saw pictures of it last year, which almost all the siding is gone at this point. But this bridge, after the roadway was abandoned, uh, the land of the road, reverted to the local landowner who was a farmer who used to run his cattle back and forth across the bridge to get to from one field to another. And as a farm crossing, the railroad is still responsible for its maintenance. 
and here's a photo of it from above. Uh, it's probably about a third of a mile walk in from the nearest road to get to the structure. And as I mentioned, it's in pretty, pretty poor condition for, for now, only used by hikers and um, going and uh, hunters going through the woods. The closest standing bridge to Sandown, since we are doing this for the Sandown Library, is here at the community center in Chester, New Hampshire. Uh, this is a pedestrian bridge built on a walking trail in two, that built in 2011 with the assistance of the Timber Framers Guild. And this was a project from the Timber Framers Guild to help show other volunteers uh, the art of bridge building, timber framing from a bridge perspective. Now, this bridge is visible from the road, but it's fairly close to the community center in Chester as well, so that it, it'd be easy to, to go in there and walk to the bridge to check it out. And we have a couple more photos of that. And the last bridge on our tour today is this one that this photograph, which is reported to have been in Sandown, but we don't have any details of the bridge. Uh, if it really was in Sandown, it would likely be over the Exeter River, being the largest watercourse in the town. Uh, but nothing is known of the photo. This was in Glenn uh, Noblock's book on covered bridges of New Hampshire. And if anyone has any details of this bridge, uh, we would certainly be interested in knowing more about it. With that, I say thank you for your time and your attention. I hope you found the presentation to be interesting. And thank you for watching.